Welcome back to Steve's World of Wonders. some reflection about why we want to protect our urban landscapes and why local democracy is important. You can have a conversation. Really, this is an open microphone. This is your opportunity. I wanted to know what you thought. I've been at the legislature all week. This is one of the things weighing on my mind. So be curious to know from your perspective where we're at with this and what we ought to do, what we could do. We'll share the microphone together, okay? We're going to have to do it with our voices. The Amplification Act security is Wired and not battery. That's on the MPP. <laughs> My mistake. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Christoph Belli, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be out here with all of you. And great to see so many people out showing their concern for the environment and the city that we live in. This is a song that I wrote recently, right around Earth Day this year just as a reminder of the fragility of the world that we live in. perspective in Ottawa Centre, we wanted to know what you thought today. It just so happens that today I spent a good part of the day talking to people who work in our hospital system. We spent the morning talking to the nurses from the Ottawa Hospital and the afternoon talking to the support staff. Our leader, Andrea Horvath, for the official opposition, she was on an Eastern Ontario tour and she wanted to meet hospital workers. And I think it's apropos of why I thought we could have a community rally and conversation about what we do about this proposal that's stampeding forward without community consultation. Let me tell you what I heard from the nurses. The nurses are telling us as the official opposition in Ontario that the Ottawa hospital is not listening to them and the government of Ontario is not listening to them. When they're telling them as, as much as you want to urge people into the occupation, they're leaving as quickly as they come in. The statistic I heard today was in the last three months, they've encouraged 55 emergency care unit nurses to come into the Ottawa hospital and 53 have left. Wow. So in and out. And there are 600 posted vacancies in all three campuses of the Ottawa hospital right now of nurses in 4,300 positions. We have a real problem. Yeah. The other thing we heard from the support staff of the Ottawa hospital at the Civic was that the Civic just made the decision, in case you hadn't heard it, to close their cafeteria closing it and in will come Subway and Tim Hortons and Pizza Pizza and these are the agencies that are apparently supposed to help the nutritional needs of people recovering from surgeries in the hospital and we heard from the support staff that there are 12 Red Seal trained chefs, professional chefs 
they have in the membership, but they don't know what their future will be. They're going to be reallocated to another place. No one mentioned that to me as the MPP that this was going to happen. We keep in regular contact with the auto hospital leadership, but I feel around the civic decision which preceded when I had the fortune to get elected and on the LRT issue, my Algonquin friends are telling me about the Taywin yeah. development south of the city again and again and again. It really seems like in many cases the unelected decision makers of our public hospitals and the elected decision makers of the city and the province who are leading those institutions are not listening to us. So what do we do about that? That's the operative question. And when I was here, Chris and others, when beautiful music was shared, thinking about this urban tree canopy that we stand to lose. What is the updated number, Diana, my friends? Is it 524? It's more than that. They have not counted any of the ancient hedgerows. Okay. We're well over 600 trees, but they haven't counted anything that's bigger than this. So, you know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of trees. So we're, we're living in a climate emergency, and these friends that we're seeing hovering over us are playing a big role in helping us think about how we not only mitigate, but how we make sure that we'll have a vibrant city 50 years from now, 60 years from now. As Diane was talking to me when I was last here about flood mitigation. What happens to a slope landscape like this when we take all the trees and the drainage capacity out? What I would love to hear from you, I want to stop talking as the politician. <laughs> I want to encourage other people to project their their opinion on what we should do. I'm hearing many things from neighbors. I'm, I'm hearing, Joel, make this an issue in the provincial election next June. Count on it. We will. I hope the other political parties do too, for what it's worth. What is our local strategy going to be on a parking garage that's going to be coming up here, four stories above ground? We were told four stories above ground, the same size as the one at the airport, 3,000 spaces in a climate emergency. I am hearing from neighbors in and around where the garage is designed to be built that, that they're thinking about all kinds of things. But I, I want to know what you think. I want to know what you think we should be mindful of from an ideas or policy perspective and what we should do from a civic action perspective. Because please tell me if I'm wrong, but it really seems as if our unelected leadership leading the public institutions and our elected leadership leading the city and the province are stampeding in a direction without our consent, without our consultation. I think our grandmothers and grandfathers built a, built a province in a country that was supposed to be better than that. I didn't know who was first, so I'm just going to go where the crow flies. Over to you. We need media attention. Okay. I've just Here's a small victory in Hindenburg. They closed Lemire Island. Yes for the bridge, they closed La Roche Park for remediation. There'll be no place for kids to kick a football around for two or three years, no place for the dogs to run. And then they fenced off Tom Brown Arena so the people working on the LRT could park on the green space in, in Tom Brown Arena. And we got so mad, so loud, we got a bit of media attention and we won that one. How did you, what was the outcome? They're not going to park their cars. They're not going to park. They've taken the fences down and they're going to let the dogs and the kids kick a ball around. There you go. We really need media attention. I went and talked to a friend who, who lives out near Manatee Station and I said, We're going to have a parking garage as big as the airport. And she said, What? People don't know. We need, we need more people to find out. We need more media attention. Okay. More media attention and, and community action work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, one of the things I don't understand about the garage, maybe I've not followed it, is why the rush to build it, right? They claim they need a parking garage for construction workers. Yeah. My sense is that what they want to do is they don't have the money yet for the hospital. Okay. It's not really, the hospital won't be built for seven or eight years, but they want to make sure that they put something in the ground that will assure this hospital takes, happens no matter what a future government decides. And the other thing is, where is the hospital getting the funding for this garage? How much is it costing? Are they getting, do they plan to get money from the province? Do they plan to get money from their foundation? You know, what are people, where is this coming from? These are not, this is a large, 
capital expense. Yep. Are they going to are they going to go to capital markets and borrow money? I don't understand this. And if this thing is going to be ready, the hospital is a good what half a kilometer away. That's what I heard, 400 meters. Yeah. So are they? Do they think that people are going to? They're going to need a shuttle bus to get people up and down. I, it doesn't really make any sense unless they want to somehow, they can't afford to build the hospital yet, but they want to make sure that they keep this site. So they're going to pave over the park and, you Did know. people hear all of that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know. Does anybody know? Yes, I do. Okay. I'm from the Dallas Lake Residents Association. Yeah. We've been looking at uh, filing uh, comments by November 12th to the city. And I would also suggest that you do so to your counselors. Uh, to describe what the problems are with the parking garage and the traffic uh, plans to get into and out of the hospital site. Because of the way they got the entrances and exits done, there will be two entrances to the garage. They're going to block up and they are going to cause uh, traffic jams of probably completely blocking both Prince of Wales and Carling, which will cause it to be difficult for ambulances to get in through the ambulance entrance. Moreover, the numbers of parking spaces that will be available once the almost 300 parking spaces that are allocated to the MCC are used is approximately the same number as the Pacific Hospital has now. However, the number of people expected to be working on the Civic Campus, refer to it as the Civic Campus, not the Civic Hospital, because there are five other very large buildings being built besides the hospital. What are they? Uh, they are um, in the order that they're going to be built. They are the Research Tower, uh, the Towers A, B, and C along Carling. Of un none of these we know how high they are because they haven't been are they commercial part. or are they for the hospital? We don't, the three towers are, we don't know. They're multi-use, quote, multi-use towers. When the Heart Institute is built, that will remove a few hundred parking spaces on the ground because there's a lot of on-ground, on-grade parking as well as the four-story <clears throat> parking garage. Yes, you're quite right. They are building the parking garage first because they need some place for the construction people to park while they're building other stuff. However, once the hospital is built and it is targeted to be built and finished and go into operation in 2028, once that's built, there's going to be competition between the construction people and the, and the hospital workers, who by the way won't have enough space to park either. Oh yes, the LRT branch. That's a good one. You know that the LRT line is planned ultimately, it has nothing to do with the hospital, ultimately planned to be double tracked. That means the trench has to get wide. The garage is going to be built over the trench. Right now, the plans are, and you can read these on the website, the official plan is stated, is that phase 1A is that the trench will be widened, then they'll be able to build a six over because just think of this. You build a garage, a very large, uh, technically three, three, four story structure over a trench. And then some years later, the city decides, okay, we're going to widen the trench. You know how difficult, expensive, and risky that is? As opposed to widen the trench first, phase 1A, because phase 1A has been committed to by the city. Because it could be extremely expensive. And many in the plans for next year. They're planning on starting building the garage approximately March next year. All right, so ambulance access, difficulty ambulance even getting onto the property, more severe traffic jams on Carling, almost a definite need to widen Prince of Wales. I don't really see that there's really not been much in way of planning for the traffic. Oh, and by the way, as far as Dow's Lake goes, they've ignored the fact that we have and they get that a lot of the traffic will be coming from Bronson. And already we get a lot of cut through traffic from <coughs> through Bronson from Bronson to Queen Elizabeth Driveway because Bronson is extremely packed at many times of the day.
they haven't even put the, us, our, our, our streets into the traffic impact assessment. We don't even appear on the map. Any questions? Money! Yeah. Oh yes, the money. Uh, we don't have an uh, absolute statement from the hospital, but where they're getting the seven hundred million. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm I'm not sure about the number, but the statement is that they're going to get the fees for paying for building a parking garage, for parking fees, and restaurant and, and donate and public donations. Like in other words, uh, not not taxpayers. They're not saying taxpayers, but I wouldn't. On that. Uh, one of our members in Dallas Lake Residents Association did an analysis using the existing recently built hospital in Oakville. And their numbers for a recently built hospital, which is fairly similar, were about double what the current hospital cost is. Uh, well, we're just looking at the hospital costs, not the other, not the other building. So, essentially, uh, we don't believe the estimate for the cost for the hospital here. Uh, and uh, oh, to answer somebody else's question, the provincial health ministry never pays for parking facilities at any hospital. This is not special to Civic. It, they don't pay for anybody's parking facilities. It's um, well, they're not, it's not treated as private. It's, it, it is the hospitals will actually own the garage, but they have to find the money someplace else other than the province. Uh, so I think I'm just about exhausted. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much. Okay, so for all future speakers, come on up here. Let's let's be a Canadian and form an orderly line as we do. You know, if you want to come to speak, come on up. First of all, two things that we should have said on a note of thanks. One. Thank you to the Algonquin people and the Anishinaabe peoples. They're the additional people of this land, and we're thankful for their ongoing friendship. And two, thank you, Samia, for giving us amplification. Where are you, Thank you very much. Joel couldn't figure it out. All right, over to you, Pat. So this was a letter I wrote to Sean, and uh, it's currently addressed to both Sean, uh, Joel, and Yasir. For me, there's only one issue at this time, the reasons behind Council's decision to select Carling Avenue, the Carling Avenue site for the proposed Civic Hospital expansion. It is not too late for the city to revoke its decision. In 2006, yes. the city cancelled a $778 million Siemens contract for the North-South Rail project without blinking an eye. Over and above the $36.7 million settlement to Siemens, CTV News estimated that the cancellation cost the city well over $50 million. This has not yet cost us anything. This is not about trees, nor mitigation. It is about what lies behind the city's rejection of the Tunney's Pasture option. By almost any criteria, Tunney's is the better choice. Better transportation, more room for expansion and uh, parking, and minimal interference with existing community and heritage infrastructure. The most obvious reason for the city's choice, in my view, is the lack of opportunity for private development on the Carling Avenue site while the profit potential of, Tunney's, of the Tunney site is considerable. This is about qui bono. Thank you, Pat. Way to go, Pat. Um, uh, my name is Susan Tanner, and uh, you've triggered a little bit more of what I would like to say. I have no confidence at all in this cabinet uh, at the provincial level and in our city hall, if you look at what's happened with the LRT, public-private partnership means that we are paying, we are giving our tax dollars to the private sector. I think it would be cheaper for them to build the hospital on their own without all this public-private da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And if we look at the context, if we look at the provincial context, we see a government that has done a systematic attack on every green or environmental 
thing in our province. Environmental Defense last night did a wonderful seminar on it. They are uh, they are documented all the things that the provincial government has done in a strategic, multi-pronged attack on the environment. And you can just look it all up in, on the Environmental Defense site. And we really, in a time of climate change, have to stand up. This is our time. Hello, uh, my name is Valerie Swinton and I'm with a very small group of eight or ten activists with Reimagine Ottawa. Our purpose is to fight developer funding of politics in our city. So we're very involved right now in the hospital uh, decision. We have a petition going that is asking why this decision was made and how it was made. It was made uh, it, in a few days by a few people behind closed doors. That is not what we call democracy. So I have a petition here. If you have not signed our petition, please do. We're up to close to 6,000 signatures on it and it is beginning to have some importance. We are also um, on a writing campaign everywhere and anywhere. Recently we wrote to Dutch media saying, Prime Minister Trudeau is visiting. Why don't you ask him about paving over Queen Juliana <laughs> Sadly, I got no calls. <laughs> In any event, um, do sign our petition. As I said, we're only about eight to ten people. We really need more volunteers. So if you're interested in working on the environmental aspect, we have a small committee on that. We also have a committee set up on costs. So please uh, speak to me about that afterward. Thank you. I'm just a citizen who happens to live near here. I was working for a committee and I was drafting a letter. And the more research I did, the more horrified I was. One little tidbit, seeing as we're in the site, they say that they're going to, they don't say destroy, but port is, is destroyed. 523 trees above 10 centimeters diameter at breast height, which is how they measure these things. They're going to replace these trees five to one. Obviously, you can't get over 2,600, almost 2,700 trees. I just wanted to mention that it is a fact. It is something I found out while doing research. Uh, I wasn't planning to speak. My name is Walter, and I'm part of a group that taught land sound. We're all familiar with that. This is just the deja vu, folks. Yeah. And somewhere behind all of this, Guess who the, uh, the uh, entrepreneur uh, engineer is? It's the same guy that was involved with Lansdowne. Says, and where did all this occur? Of course, in the mayor's office. Yeah. The mayor has already declared there's no way, there's no way they're going to move the station closer to the hospital, in case any of you missed that calling. We have to find some chink in the wall. And the only chink that I could see, personally, was the uh, board of uh, direct governors. That's what they're called. They're supposed to represent us, believe it or not, okay? There's a chair and a vice chair. You can look it up, it's easy. I think they have to be invited to a meeting like this to account for the Board of Governors, which are volunteers to represent the community. Okay, so that's all I have to say. And, and last but not least, there's something wrong in this world when a climate action world committee is meeting and we're standing on a territory which will be demolished. Something's amiss there. My name is Christina McKenney Robbins. Our community developed a committee to initially provide a submission to the city. We undertook letter writing to every single level of government. Each level of government essentially answered back, pointing the finger at the other. No one would answer the reasons 
for the decision that was made to not use honey, but to use this prized historic lamb. Yesterday afternoon, at one o'clock, our small community had arranged for the head of the hospital, Cameron Love, and his associate to speak to our community. They have held a Zoom call. It was chaired by a resident of our condominium. It began with the statement, we will not address site location. So of course, my husband and myself, as the chair of our committee, our first question was, yes, all of these levels of government have made this decision to this point. Whether it changes or not, we are citizens and we deserve an answer as to why Honey's pastor was not acceptable. That's not an unreasonable question. If you're a decision maker in a democratic country, you should have an answer. Cameron Love's answer was to look at the woman chairing our meeting and said, we had an agreement not to discuss the site, and he refused to answer our question. So I'm simply pointing out this fact as we move forward. It's virtually impossible to get any politician at any level of government, the board of governors of the hospital, I've read all of their minutes. They make sure that their minutes only say things like, wonderful work is progressing on the new civic. They're not going to put in writing what happened behind closed doors. So I'm going to ask you to make an access to information request. Do you know how futile that would be? Because whatever they did, they decided it in secrecy. You have to know what you're looking for. You can't just go on a fishing expedition. You will pay thousands of dollars and get nothing. So my comment to all of you is what we seem to have failed somehow to be able to achieve is to get that sort of investigative interest from somebody, whether it's the Fifth Estate or it's the David Suzuki organization. We can't get the media because the media well, they rely on all those developers who have to put ads in their newspapers. And they've been very poor, except for, yes. And they don't report on it either. So, so we need media, and we need someone who answers a very simple question. I'm frustrated, but I continue to come out, and I will come out until the end. That's what I have to do. I worked for 29 years full time at the Ottawa Hospital. I worked with I worked with um, stroke patients. I worked with brain injury patients. I worked with palliative and ALS patients. And I really believe that we provided first class service. And I was really proud when I retired a few years ago to leave. But you know, the other part of the story is that what got me through those 29 years of working with all those patients was almost every night I came down here and I walked my dog and it gave me that work-life balance that I needed. And you know, this is not all about me. This is about all of you and it's about all of Ottawa and it's about all of those people from all across the country that come here because of the history, the farm history, the agriculture. It's a legacy. And what we're doing, this is a terrible mistake. It was a good idea gone really, really wrong. And we need to change it. Hi, Sahai Saif here. I am finishing a master's uh, looking into critical habitat protection for species at risk. I can tell you that we have 1,209 species that are at risk from fungi, plants, mammals, birds, name it. And in a world that's carbon intensive and focusing on just that, when we also have methane contributing to the warming of our planet because of our disposable society and the, the culture, we cannot afford to keep building urbanized structures. We have to have developing in the, in the effort to rewild our areas beyond the location 
sensibility, which is a tiny versus a place that holds trees that are hundreds, hundred to 150 years old, some of them. Thank you very much for being here. I'm excited that people are out here, but I want more people our age and younger generation to talk about this. Rewilding is very important. Rewilding is something that I've been talking about, I've been putting out there, and I don't know where it goes. I don't know why we're not talking about this. We keep building these pavements, uh, structures, and they, they do nothing for our health, so we keep having to build hospitals to compensate for that. And I don't, un like, you know, like, uh, and they teach us to have logic in university structure, and I try to follow that really very diligently, but when they go against the democratic rights of people that vote for something, then why am I in school? Why am I in school? Thank you. I'm going to admit to Pete, we have some more people who want to speak, but I'm also mindful that as we do this, we're looking after ourselves, as, as the speaker just said. So let me take liberty and say we need music too. Can I ask for a quick musical interlude with people in mind? Is that okay? Hey everybody, and right over there with that hat on, well everybody's got a hat on, but that person right there is Christoph Kelly. He and I are organizing a national tree songs event. And in our concert, we are definitely going to mention this space here. They're all across the country, as everybody's saying, but this one is particularly, particularly horrible. This one here, and personally, we have to save these trees. We can't say we're just going to go and let them be destroyed. We have to save these trees. That's what I'm saying. So, and please don't underestimate people's love of trees. Don't estimate that. That's a powerful force. And if we can unleash that force, and if we can show people what's being planned for this, we can win. We can win. We can make a stand. We can do this. We have to do this. What's the alternative? I have a question. Song. What's that? My question is, if, if anybody voting for the hospital at this site has not talked to one of these trees, they should not be allowed to vote. <laughs> Well, that's my point. The trees are not getting any representation here at all. And in some courts of law, trees and rivers do have rights to be represented. And I would love to see an injunction here that says nothing happens to these trees until their rights have been considered. I don't think that's really outrageous. I think that's totally logical, considering all the benefits they've given us and every other creature and being an entity in this entire world. So here's, here's my tree, Save the Tree song. You're singing on the chorus, right? Right. <laughs> Let's save the trees. Let's not cut them off at the knees. Let's join in the chorus. They're all rooting for us to help them. So let's save the trees. Those are the words. Let's save the trees. Let's not chop them off at the knees. Let's join in the chorus. They're all rooting for us to help them. So let's save the trees. Yeah, sounding good. Yeah. Hello, friends. My name is Marjorie Robertson. I don't have a long message, but I do think it is time that we ask the question, is corruption destroying our nation's capital? Already, we have had two debacles, uh, Lansdowne Park and Light Rail. We cannot afford a third, you know, mess up in the nation's capital. And I agree with the speakers who have said that it isn't too late to stop this hospital. It's clear there's no planning behind it. It's clear that it's an irresponsible project. So I would just say, and to echo everybody else, Tunney's was well thought out. The NCC spent years doing their due diligence. We have to fight for that site. Thank you. My name is Michael. It's not the first time I'll be uh, taking on Jim Watson. I challenged him when they, they cut all the bus services back when he first got back in office, but I plan to do this again. He lied about transparency to, uh, at City Hall at the last election. It's not being done. He is no friend to the transit rider. No. Increase in certain fares, terrible service, and he destroys trees to build a parking lot. 
He's not a friend to the environment. He's an enemy to the environment. Watson, City Planning Committee and developers do not have the best interests of the citizens of the Ottawa. And our voices will be heard at the next election in the city. All we have to do is make sure that the public outlets, CTV, we got to get them involved because when we stood up for the cuts at OC Transpo years back when, we had old, uh, city uh, CTV and uh, the Sun, I got a hold of them and they uh, they made sure that the next day any any kind of meetings that the um, uh, transit had people were lining up to voice their uh, their opposition out at Canada, out at City Hall, out at Bronson, out at uh, at uh, Jim Dur Arena. That's the only way we're going to stop them. And they they had to cut back and give us back our services in some way, one or another. They're just trying to destroy the city with the with their corruption of the uh, with the developers and the planning. They're not listening to the people that are here in the city. I know there's not a lot of people here, but at the at the bit gets out to the media outlets and everybody starts talking to the media, then we'll be heard. I'm going to try not to repeat what other people say, but I mean, we really do have a complete demolished democracy right now. We've got people who are running for the next four-year term or running for the next eight years until they secure a pension. They don't really don't care. And what we're getting is press releases instead of plans. Press releases instead of action. And we have absolutely no common sense. In the planning department, it's a revolving door between the development industry and the planning department. You see someone leave planning, and the development industry pays for a party. You see someone retire, and who helps with that funding? So we do have, at the moment, what I consider to be a very corrupt government at the local level. Oh, yeah. 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 It's the, reason, it's the reason back in 1994 that I ran for mayor, and it is the same thing now. So it hasn't changed in those 25 years. It hasn't changed at all. It's the same thing. The developers own city council, with the exception of the four fine people who continue to vote against the motions. Our local councilor, Sean Menard, is fantastic. Catherine McKinney is stalwart. Uh, Jeff Leeper has been on side. And recently we had one other who voted with us. I can't remember who it was, but I, I think it was actually Riley Brockington from uh, Vanier. But he did at least vote against the master plan. Okay, so I, he was a Johnny-come-lately on that. We definitely need to protect our planet. And I think that we need some planners who have some vision in that regard. I want to thank all of the people who do stand up and act as citizens, and we're, we're all part of that. And I want to thank Joel for calling us together. Um, I want to mention something very immediate, which I don't know if people notice today. But there's water in the LRT tunnel. These trees and this green space absorb a massive amount of runoff. And if we chop them down, we're going to fill up the LRT tunnel. And it'll be no good anymore, even if it was. <laughs> so what we need is some long-term vision and some planning. We don't need any more press releases. And that's not just municipal. That's federal too. And we've got to hold their feet to the fire. The federal government leased this land, all of this land, for $1 a year for the next 99 years. Just like Lansdowne Park, $1 a year. For whose profit? Graham Bird? Other developers? We have to go after them. It's wrong, it's corrupt, and it's time that we got our democracy back. So, thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Vorabe. I just want to pick up uh, all these excellent comments, that, the illumination that we're receiving today. It's a pattern about money. I have this image in my mind of the same big construction firms, the same big engineering firms, the same slimy consulting firms. They're in on every project. We're on the outside, the citizens in a, in a democratic system, 
there on the inside. This is about robbing the public purse. I don't want to come across as a conservative here because I'm certainly not, but this is about robbing and plundering our tax dollars that we pay. I do not measure city council or the Queen's Park or Parliament Hill against perfection. I just measure them against reasonableness and the fact that most people on this planet have no access to democracy whatsoever. I am here to defend this wonderful heritage site, which is 140 years old. Yeah. I'm here to, and more than that, I'm here to work with people and to help people and to, f to defend our democracy. But as getting back to the money, it's always the same. PCL, Alice Dawn, SNC Lavalon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just an old boys club. How much money can we grab? How fast? And I'll say what's been hinted at already. I, we were discussing the, all the condos that they can build at Tunney's now because they're moving the hospital or trying to move the hospital over here. And I've just been getting a laugh lately thinking about these developers saying, why didn't we just ask to build the condos in an experimental farm? They, they might be going up by now. That's how dysfunctional this city is, yeah. this province and this federal government. It sounds like a sick joke, but it's really not that far from the ugly truth and the ugly realities we're dealing with. So thank you all for caring, number one, thank you for being here. I'll continue to work with everyone as much as I can and do my bit, so thank you. I'm Sharon Goldhawk, uh, representing One World Arts, and I'm the co-founder of the One World Film Festival. So I'm documenting um, and hoping to do a documentary on this whole issue. Um, I don't want to simplify and, and blame, but it's about keeping agreements. And as far as I've been looking at it from many directions, and I, I'm an activist, and, and my group works with human rights, social justice, and the environment. But the original agreement was to build the parking underground. Yes. Yes. Okay? Yes. Now that, I know maybe some people are on one side or the other with the, many of these things, but as far as I'm concerned, pin them to the wall on the agreement. I, I agree with the Tunney's pastor, it should go back there. But first, Go back to why, what is this upground, underground? They, they actually said, we'll do it, parking will be underground, no problem. First, pin them to the wall on the original agreement, okay? Because fighting, pushing back to Tunney's Pasture is the best idea. Go after what is possible, what is tangible. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a national, a Canadian national heritage site. It's a Canadian national issue. This should, be the, this should be an issue, an election issue, because as far as I'm concerned, all of Canada should be aware of this and fighting for this. This, this, this land belongs to Canada. All of Canada. To me, this should be saved by all of Canada for all, of all, for all Canadians. Right? It's federal land. This deal was made behind closed doors. Now let's go back. We will never know what was said, who said what, but it's... You know, tree hugging, it's time, okay? <laughs> I think it was Diane that said, uh, we need vision, we need planning. We've had vision, we've had planning. We knew what we had to do when I came out of university 40 odd years ago. The thing is, nobody has been willing to do it. And that's the problem. You know, it's the trees will be here, but nobody is willing to do it. And that's what we're dealing with. I knocked on a door in the recent federal election. That's what people in my profession do. It's important. And the person who answered that door, I'm not going to say who it was, but it was somebody who served for many years on the Ottawa Hospital Board. And we got into an argument over this issue. And this person said to me, Joel, do you know one of the reasons why we need this parking garage? I said, what? He said, we have to pay for MRI machines. Oh. I said, pardon me? He said, true. well, apparently, I actually followed up, I, I contacted the legislative research branch uh, at the legislature in Toronto and I said, can you give me a sense of how significant parking revenue is for revenue sources for hospitals? And it's very significant actually. Yes. So I, 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 we started today, I wanted to tell you what I heard from nurses and support staff at the auto hospital and how they haven't felt heard for years and how some of them are leaving their professions at the exact time when we need them the most. We've relied on them so much in the last 19 months and they're burnt out and they're stressed out. And when I talk to them, that's what, that's what I heard today. I think I can tell you this, this is not a partisan issue for me. We have to make sure we are not funding hospitals with parking garages. Yes. Yes. And after tonight, 
we are going to continue to be in touch with you. I'm going to continue to be in touch with my municipal colleagues, with federal colleagues, with people leading these institutions, because I am hearing loud and clear from the community through email and through phone and through social media that people do not feel heard and they feel this is rushed. And if the province and if the city and if the auto hospital board are in a rush to build a parking garage by March, then maybe as a community we should be having a discussion about how that doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 So I'm hearing about, I heard earlier tonight an idea of a, let's let's do a formal letter to the Ottawa Hospital Board for a consultation, maybe in a bit of a warmer environment, <laughs> and we can, we can procure that. That's our job. We can try to set that table so people can come and ask their questions, and I hope the Ottawa Hospital Board comes. Yeah. Um, but I'm also hearing from a lot of neighbours saying, Joel, if they don't come, uh, I'm going to be there in March or whenever they want to start construction on this. I will be there. It's not right. Yeah. I was not told. So if that's something on your minds too, I want you to write me about that. That's okay. I want you to talk to me about that because there's a very proud uh, tradition in this country of folks peacefully doing what they need to do to make sure projects do not get stampeded ahead when they're not in the democratic interest. Someone's trying to get my yeah, attention. I'm being asked if we have chains to chain ourselves to the trees. You can get them at uh, the Canadian Tire. There's a lot of people who are very store. clever that when we get a community project in motion can make things happen. I know that. I know that. I want to thank every last one of you for coming tonight. Um, is there a final word here? I have a question. Shoot. If you have access to the funds for research, can you find out if there's some legal mistake they've made in the process that we could capitalize on to stop it the question was if you didn't hear um we we have access to research and we can figure out if there's a flaw legally it's been made the legal charge can be made that's a good question and i'll find out we'll there's, one, there's one thing that has not been done yeah an independent environmental assessment yeah. for that you have to ask Woo. the federal minister for the environment oh. But no independent environmental assessment was done on this project. Correct. And the new environment minister, Mr. Stephen Gilbo, if you know who he is, yeah. he should be approached. That's a great idea. Correct. That's yes. fantastic. We're on that too. So the question was, have I in my capacity as the MPP for Auto Center approached the Minister of Health, the Deputy Minister of Health? Did you mention Minister of Finance? Okay. So what I can say is I have privately raised this with the Minister of Health. Um, and the response I got was that the minister was aware that the community was concerned, but I had no commitments beyond that. There's a very long line of people trying to talk to the minister about I'm not written her a formal letter, that's a good idea, so we should consider that. Um, minister of Finance, no. I haven't brought this up with um, Minister Beth and Colby, but that's another good idea. We should, and we should write a formal letter. But I think before the community moves into more assertive action, that's the right way to talk about it, politely, civil, peaceful, assertive action, we have to be able to say we made any number of appeals to officials. It's a good point. Um, yeah. When are the saws supposed to show up? That's the yeah, question. Like doing it the day before they have. They well, they're coming Tuesday and they show up Monday. This is where we will need the, uh, we were just asked, when will crews come to begin work? You don't know the answer to that question. Diane, do you know the answer to that question? No, but they've already taken the names and the names Stay tuned for next steps. Um, Val Scott of the Kitchen, you can sign. Oh, thank you.